like I said before, um, this conference uh, really is focused on how we make uh, more success stories like Gary happen more often, uh, how we can do our part in our communities and how we can do it together. Um, but to do this, we really need data, right? We need data to understand if our efforts are actually working. Um, and our next presentation is going to be a combination presentation with Dr. Newmar and our executive director, Terry Shields. Uh, Terry Shields is our executive director of Save My Heart and the State of Michigan CARES coordinator. Um, she does a tremendous job, and I think she's canvassed almost the entire state of Michigan with CARES. She'll tell us more about that. Uh, it's a great resource, really, for us to know if we go out and do an intervention, are we, is, is it working, right? So that's, that's really uh, the crux of this, and so it's really important. And then Dr. Newmar will come up after that. Um, and Dr. Newmar is the professor and chair of emergency medicine at the University of Michigan Medical School. He is the past chair of the American Heart Association ECC Committee and a delegate to the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation and as a co-founder and president of Save My Heart. Uh, I'd like to bring up Terry uh, to uh, uh, do a talk. Um, there is a, a video, so uh, hopefully the, it will work. <laughs> Oh, you, you, want to, you want to do? Okay. Great. I'll let you come up then. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pribble. Um, I just have a few just quick remarks. Mostly, I'm Terry Shields. I'm the CARES coordinator for Michigan. I just want most of you to put a name um, and with my face because I know I interact most with people by email collecting your data. And I just want to thank all of you, um, all of the EMS agencies, first responders, and hospital personnel who contribute to the CARES data. Um, by putting the data into the CARES database, you're taking a first step in quality improvement and trying to improve your system of care. So um, we are just so delighted that you're all here attending our conference today. So. Um, we can share what we're doing across the state to help improve best practices to um, increase survival. Um, I cover about 85% of the state's population with CARES. So we have over 100 EMS agencies and over 115 hospitals putting data into the database. And Dr. Newmar will go into more depth regarding um, our Michigan data. Um, we're, we are improving, um, but we still have a long ways to go. Um, so by coming to this and attending the conference today, um, we can share what we're doing in our communities, what works, what doesn't work. Um, and so I just want to thank you all for your efforts and CARES. And I have sent most all of the attendees today CARES reports that are customized reports for your community, whether it was for your first responder, your county, um, or your agency or hospital. Um, but if you didn't get a report and if you would like something more specific, please come see me at the break. I'll be sitting out there in the vendor area and I can create some custom reports for you. So um, thank you again. It's always so nice to have survivors here. So we have Gary here and we have Michael here. So um, that really makes my day because I spend most of my time reviewing records where the patient does not survive. So when everything in the system goes right and we have a survivor, it just really is, it, it, just, it, it just makes all the work we do so much worth it. So um, CARES, National CARES, put together a very nice video, um, and it talks about the importance of CARES. So we're going to show you that video right now, and hopefully it will work. So I'm afraid to touch any buttons up here, but I think I touched this one. This one. I've just been a normal kid. My entire life. Um, I grew up an avid athlete. I started t-ball when I Sorry. I've just been a normal kid my entire life. Um, I grew up an avid athlete. I started t-ball when I was four. I did cheer from the time I could cheer. And I went on the treadmill one day just to go take a run. I was at my local gym and while I was running doing something I've done every day of my life. Um, I died doing that. So about two weeks before he was going to go off to college, he was playing adult league with his dad like he usually does. And I went to this game. We're, we're playing. My son makes a shot. Something went wrong. So he, he collapses. Everything that happened is just so, so fast. It's all a blur. They call 911. 
Uh, one of the referees said, Vern, I think we need, we need to do CPR because I'm not, I'm not getting a pulse. And so I said, let's, let's, let's go to work. Before the CARES registry, we had no idea how often we responded to cardiac arrests. We had no idea how often bystanders were performing CPR. We didn't know how often a publicly available AED was deployed. And most importantly, we didn't know who was surviving to hospital discharge with good functional capacity. For any problem, you have to diagnose what's wrong before you can prescribe a treatment. So when you collect data and enter it into the CARES registry, it's like performing a system assessment. It'll show you the things that you're doing well, and it will also show you your opportunities for improvement, not just on an individual level, but from a system perspective. Things that I hadn't realized were significant, all of a sudden, I absolutely saw how significant they were. And exactly as everybody else has been saying, if you can't measure what you're doing and you can't ask the question of how are we doing, then how can you ever change it? How can you ever improve on it? And so that's what CARES did for us. It, it allowed us to see some numbers and then to really take those numbers and say, well, what do they mean? How do we get these numbers? And for the ones that we didn't like very much, how do we change this? We really started drilling down on what we were doing and changing what we were doing. And all of a sudden we saw some difference and it was phenomenal to see the buy-in from the guys in the field uh, and, and see their attitude shift. And when their attitude shifts, that's really the key because then their actions will follow. So I do have the honor of being the president of the National Association of EMS Physicians. Our membership is comprised of EMS medical directors from across the country, as well as EMS professionals uh, in, in that same uh, setting. I've been involved in CARES with the programs in, you know, in which I'm involved uh, since um, really just a few years after its inception, so quite a long time now. It's certainly helped us evolve as a system and to improve our systems of care. So the value of this is the measure and improve metric. All the members in our organization see the value in this, know that this is how they improve the health care, the public health aspect of cardiac arrest, and uh, provide the chance for people to basically be reanimated to bring them back to life after suffering uh, these events that happen in all of our communities. to improve survival from out of hospital cardiac arrest that have not been utilized in an equitable fashion across populations. The three that I'm talking about are AED use, bystander CPR, and telecommunicator CPR. Uh, these three have all been validated with multiple studies, multiple populations. They don't break the bank, and they're things that have true impact in communities. And it's demonstrative improvement of two to three times increasing of the survival rate just by doing these small things. Part of the problem in getting there is the capture of data is limited to about half of the country, um, which is really great for most registries. But when it comes to something that's hyper-local, like driving survival from out of heart at hospital cardiac arrest, we absolutely need to know where to allocate resources and where to um, develop buy-in with local policymakers, decision makers. And the only way to do that is through telling the effective story and capturing the voices that matter. And that means expanding the reach of data capture. If you look at our cardiac arrest survivors on Hilton Head Island, many of them were otherwise healthy. Many of them were relatively young, but because we made it our explicit goal to strengthen the chain of survival, we pulled them back from the brink of getting as close to death as you can possibly get. And that is very rewarding to an EMS chief, to a community. Um, it's just, it's very gratifying to look back on my career and realize that that is the level of system performance that we enjoy here on this island. Hawaii has been participating in CARES. We see the value. We are saving lives. 
And it's not just that one person. We are saving the family. Um, we're continuing to work on it. We're getting better because Hawaii cares. Three weeks after he got out of the hospital, he was in school. Um, and he finishes an associate's degree, ended up at UCF, and finishes his bachelor's degree. And he's, he's living his dream up in New York as a film producer. He's, he's doing his thing. I work at a children's hospital on the cardiac unit now. I get to live out something that I thought was going to ruin my life. has now changed it for so much better. I understand and I know that cardiac arrest happens to anyone, everywhere. And it's the resources that make the biggest difference to survival. Cares matters because it saves lives. All right, can everybody hear me? All right, we have sound back to the microphone. Excellent. All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Newmar. I'm uh, Chair of Emergency Medicine at the University of Michigan and uh, have, you know, along with many, many other people, um, sort of began this journey here in the state of Michigan with the creation of Save My Heart with the goal of significantly improving out-of-hospital cardiac arrest survival and I'm just really delighted to see all of you here, uh, you know, uh, engaged in, in uh, the work that we're doing uh, and hoping that by the end of the day, you'll have some uh, motivation and, and ideas to take back to your local community that will have a significant impact. So my disclosures, uh, in addition to my work at University of Michigan, I'm currently the chair, co-chair of the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, which is a uh, international body that uh, works to evaluate the uh, science of resuscitation and make uh, treatment recommendations that are used by organizations like the American Heart Association to create their guidelines. Uh, as mentioned before, I'm the president and board chair of uh, Save My Heart, and I previously uh, chaired the American Heart Association Emergency Cardiovascular Care Committee. I've had, for disclosures, funding from both NIH uh, and the American Heart Association for research projects, and I get equipment support from Stryker EMS for uh, research projects in the laboratory setting. So have you heard, as you've all heard so far, um, you know, the, the system of care for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is really critical uh, for improving outcomes. And it, I got to say, it's probably one of the most complex systems of care for any medical illness that we deal with, right? Because we're reliant on typically, and, and most often, you know, at the home or in the public setting, that uh, you know, a lay person, uh, a bystander, a family member is required to make the diagnosis, right? Activate the healthcare system and provide the most important therapy, which is initiating uh, chest compressions. Uh, and then, you know, it, beyond that, then we have a very complex system where we have police and fire first responders, paramedics. Uh, the patient goes to the emergency department. Uh, there's a team that takes care of the patient there. Then maybe they go to the coronary or the cath lab for an intervention and then to the ICU and then home and rehab. And it is an incredibly complex system of care for, you know, the most life-threatening illness that we deal with. Uh, and it's really, the success is really dependent on this whole chain of survival and we can only be as strong as the weakest link. And, but I, I got to emphasize, and I think the data has, you know, uh, supported that is the, the most important and impactful interventions are the ones that occur early. So early recognition, early chest compressions, early rhythm analysis and defibrillation, if indicated, are what make the big difference. So, um, you know, I think understanding that and then looking at our own data, uh, you know, statewide and comparing that to national data will, and even then looking at the variability amongst our different uh, systems of care is one way that we can try to optimize that. Because like, like was said in the video, if we can't measure what we're doing, it's very, really difficult to improve it. So what I'm going to do today is go over uh, our statewide data compared to national data uh, to see how we're progressing over the past, uh, I guess it's eight years now that we've been uh, uh, 
uh, collecting and reporting data. Uh, and then I'll talk about the variability that we have within the state. And this has been our tradition for this conference every year, is just, you know, we, we collect and report the data, but we all want to bring it to the community uh, to see how we're uh, making progress and see in areas where we're not making progress. So, we talked about that. So, uh, you, you've already been introduced to the CARES registry, but the data I'm going to report is from our statewide CARES, CARES registry. Uh, you've met Terry Shields, who's our state coordinator. Just some of the information about how extensive the registry is here in the state of Michigan. Uh, we have 134 EMS agencies reporting to the CARES registry, uh, 109 hospitals are reporting to the CARES registry. The Michigan population most recently estimated at 10.1 million and our estimated CARES coverage for the state of Michigan is about 8.8 .8 million, so about 80% of the population of the state of Michigan uh, is covered by our CARES registry, which is really uh, significant in terms of being able to look at and estimate the uh, progress in cardiac arrest resuscitation. So in 2021, we had 9,634 treated cardiac arrests in the state, uh, and that gives an incidence of about 110 per 100,000. So uh, another way to think about that simply is about uh, for one out of a 1,000 people in the state of Michigan will have a out-of-hospital cardiac arrest treated each year, all right? And when you think about that compared to other things that we prepare for, uh, like, you know, home fires or tornadoes or disasters, uh, you know, your chance of dying of those things are nowhere near the chance of one in a thousand in, in any one year of uh, being treated for an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So uh, I'm gonna go into the data. So uh, each one of these graphs, just to orient you, is going to be our data in the state of Michigan in red uh, relative to the national data in black. Uh, and we've been tracking this now since 2014. Uh, and each one of these slides will sort of at the top will have our current um, uh, rate uh, relative to 2014 when we started. And then the graphs will sort of see our progress. So in this example, we have bystander CPR. Uh, back when we started, we were at 36.7%. Uh, we are now at 41.4%, uh, uh, just right around the national average, which is good. But you can see the progress we've made relative to back in 2014 and 2015, where we were below the national average. We actually sort of hit our peak in 2019, where we actually crossed the curve and got above the national average, which we were excited about and uh, celebrating. Then the COVID pandemic hit, uh, and we sort of dropped down a little bit. But you can see we still have a little bit of a recovery, but we would like to get ultimately up to a 50% bystander CPR rate, and that's something we want to continue to work on. Now, remember, these are averages across the state. So for each one, a lot of these data points, I'm going to show you the variability, which I think you'll find surprising. So if you look at the variability uh, in bystander CPR rates, it's pretty significant. And I'll orient you to this data. This is by EMS reporting agency. Uh, and this only includes agencies that treat uh, at least 50 non-traumatic cardiac arrests a year. So agencies that only have a handful of cardiac arrests, the data is not in here because that could create significant outliers. But if you have, you know, agencies that have at least 50 cardiac arrests a year, the range of bystander CPR is from 8% to 75%. So that's like an order of magnitude difference in the bystander CPR rate. Uh, and you can see you know, about there's a significant uh, group of uh, systems where you have a bystander CPR rate, uh, as, you know, up to 65% or above. And what this says to me, and it should hopefully it would say to you, uh, what is possible, right? So this, this kind of data where we see our re regional variability within the state uh, shows what's possible to achieve uh, here. And so I, I think you know, when you look at this kind of data, what it tells me is that this idea of getting to 50% bystander CPR rate uh, is feasible, and there's about 10 uh, you know, areas of the systems of care uh, here in Michigan that have been able to achieve that. So going on to bystander AED application. Now, when we talk about bystander AED application, this includes public access AED, but also included in this data, and correct me if I'm wrong, Terry, is nursing home uh, AED application. And uh, so you can see that we've actually done quite well with this, right? So uh, we started back in 2014 a little higher than the national average. We got a peak up to about 10%, plateaued a little bit last year and maybe down a little bit this year. 
uh, but well above the national average. We started at 6.3%, we're now at 9%. But I will give the caveat here that, again, the majority of these are uh, uh, bystander applied at a nursing home because that's the way it's categorized. And I think if you look at the data for public access AEDs uh, that are utilized, um, that number is a lot smaller in terms of the total percent of cardiac arrest. I think that's around 1% or 2%. Um, but still doing pretty well with that. Uh, how, do we, how do we do in terms of achieving return of spontaneous circulation? Uh, so back in uh, 2014, we were at 26.3%. Uh, we're now at 28.5%, so still better than when we started. We were well ab below the national average. Now, you can see interesting trends here where the national average has been trending down over time. Uh, we trended up, sort of met the national average there at 30% uh, in 2019. And then again, this 2019 to 2020 decline uh, associated with the COVID pandemic and the changes that occurred, both in the, the incidence of cardiac arrest went up. A lot of those cardiac arrests were either related to COVID itself or delays in care. Um, so our survival rate both here in Michigan and nationally uh, declined. But you can see we have had a significant rebound in the past year, which is very encouraging and actually better than what happened uh, nationally, which hasn't seen that kind of a rebound that we've seen here in the state of Michigan. So kudos to our EMS systems, our first responders, our bystanders, and our uh, paramedics for uh, that rebound in uh, return of spontaneous circulation rate. But again, uh, just to highlight the opportunity here is when we look at that variability, uh, we again see an order of magnitude difference of you know four percent a range of four percent versus forty four percent for return of spontaneous circulation across various systems uh, in the state of Michigan, uh, which you know further illustrates in my mind this idea that we have an opportunity. Uh, we have some you know significant number of sites are getting above thirty five percent, which I think is as a goal that we can sort of uh, aspire to. So uh, survival to hospital discharge uh, is uh, this past year was at 7.7%. Um, we started at 7.9% back in 2014. Uh, we were making significant progress, again, uh, up until the COVID pandemic when we had a big drop in survival uh, to hospital discharge, which also occurred at the national level. Uh, again, a lot of that was attributed to what I talked about before, where we had the significant contribution of COVID itself in terms of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, but also, uh, you know, potentially uh, people delaying, uh, delaying care and, and delays sometimes in uh, getting access to care related to um, changes in the way we, we did out-of-hospital treatment with don having to don PPE, uh, which could have caused some delays and then um, other, other differences. But we've seen... A, uh, what looks like a rebound here in the state of Michigan that's been associated with our rebound in return of spontaneous circulation, uh, unlike what's happened nationally, which is that plateauing. So uh, I think we all want to be at a much higher rate in terms of survival to hospital discharge. I think a goal would be to uh, get at least get above 10% and, and do even higher than that in the future. Uh, but we did we have lost ground, if you look, since 2017 uh, in that particular um, outcome, which is really our, our, our primary outcome. But again, there's, there's hope, right? Because if you look at the, you look at the variability within the state, uh, again, we see this huge variability of 1% uh, to 17% with, you know, at least 10 or more, uh, systems of care achieving that, uh, survival to hospital discharge above 10%. So there, there is opportunity there. And then the ultimate outcome is survival with good neurologic outcome. It's a proportion of the patients that survived hospital discharge. You can see a similar pattern. Uh, we are at 6.5%. We were at 6.2% in 2014. Uh, we've increased relative to last year, but not gotten back to our peak, which was at about 8%, uh, which we think uh, is, an, is an achievable goal. And then uh, one of the challenges uh, with you know sort of looking at how uh, in that system of care is one way we look is at hospital mortality. So if you survive long enough to get admitted to the hospital, what's your chances of then surviving to hospital discharge? And you can see that our data is um, uh, the mortality once you get 
admitted to the hospital was 67.6%. Uh, we were at 66% back in 2014. So basically, of the people that get, survive long enough to get admitted, about a third uh, will survive to hospital discharge. And we haven't made much progress in uh, changing that either nationally uh, or uh, at the local, at the statewide level. But similar to the other uh, parameters we've talked about, uh, there is significant variability. This is about the biggest range you could possibly have, right, from zero to 100%. Uh, so, um, uh, and then, you know, the whole range in between. So, you know, even within, on the hospital side of things, uh, you know, the, where you get admitted to the hospital after you're out of hospital cardiac arrest uh, has uh, an impact on your chances of surviving. And that suggests there's some significant opportunity. Some of the interventions that are done in the hospital, uh, we think about as both coronary angiography to sort of diagnose and treat a myocardial infarction. You can see there's significant variability. Uh, and this is the, this is the rates of using coronary angiography where you actually go to the cath lab and at least, uh, study the coronary arteries for an occlusion that could be treated. Uh, and the range of, these are the percent of patients that get admitted to different hospitals. Uh, how many of those patients or what percentage go for angiography, and that ranges from 0 to 23%. And then therapeutic hypothermia, which has become a little bit more controversial in terms of the therapeutic uh, benefit, uh, the way we implement it, uh, still has significant variability, uh, ranging from, again, 0 to 100% of the patients being treated in that way. So to summarize you know, where we are relative to uh, the nation, uh, again, here in red is Michigan, uh, and in black is our national data. And this is sort of the looking, following down the chain of survival. If you look at return of spontaneous circulation, uh, we seem to do uh, a little bit better uh, than the national average, but then we fall below the national average once we get to survival to admission discharge. And then we're a little bit below the national average uh, with survival with good neurologic outcome. And I just want to reemphasize that uh, although that number is lower than we want, uh, we, there clearly is an opportunity uh, to improve based on what we can see, what's possible uh, in the state of Michigan with these uh, variabilities, a range of 1% to 17% in survival with good neurologic outcome. So things we can learn uh, from you know, higher performing uh, systems with, with, with better results, what we can learn from them and try to apply those to some of the systems that uh, aren't quite as good in terms of the, the outcomes. It's, it's not necessarily, and some of that may be related to the patient population in those um, regions and not necessarily the EMS performance. So it's all not just the performance of system of care, but we need to look at every single component that could contribute to outcomes and try to optimize that. Uh, but I think if, if people in our community saw the, this variability, right, and said, well, it depends on where I live, uh, what my chances of surviving a cardiac arrest could be anywhere from 1% to 17%. I think uh, the people of you know, Michigan would sort of want to say, well, you know, how can we decrease that variability and increase people's chances of surviving? And, and the way I've said this before is you shouldn't have to be lucky to survive a cardiac arrest. We hear oftentimes when we hear survivor stories, and we have our, some of our survivors here um, talk about, um, you know, everything, all the stars had to be aligned. Uh, in order for this to actually be a good outcome. Uh, and our hope for a future state is that it's more common to, uh, you know, hear, hear a story of someone who, it's common to hear a story about someone surviving a cardiac arrest. It's more common, more uncommon to hear a story that says, well, you know, they should have survived a cardiac arrest and what went wrong, rather than it's, it's a miracle that the stars align in, in order to survive a cardiac arrest. And hopefully, uh, as we go through our day today, I just really want everyone to sort of think about the goals that we can try to set in terms of specific, measurable, attainable, and realistic goals with a timeline uh, to change uh, the outcomes for our, uh, the population of the state of Michigan. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Pribble or answer any questions. Yes, there right there, Bob. Um, so we're going to open up the questions for Dr. Newmar. Uh, can come around with the microphone. Um, this just gives us a real good baseline of where we are with data, also shows us the variability and also provides us opportunities, right? So um, are there any questions for Dr. Neymar? So, Bob, hold, hold on, Brian. I know you got a big mouth, but. <laughs> <laughs> 
we have to. Um, so the hundred percent is just outrageous. I don't remember there was six for a hundred percent, but you on the yeah, you changed your meter to greater than five. So they only before it was like you needed to have greater than fifty to to for some of these things, but greater than five admits. Are those are all those like you know five and six or seven? Because um, that's that's pretty outrageous to almost impossible. Yeah, so this is, um, again, I, I probably should have clarified when I transitioned to hospital based data, uh, those were greater than five cases. So the EMS data is greater than 50. The hospital based data, you have to have at least five cases for this data. So yes, and we can dig into that. Some of these, this is mortality, right? So this is if, you know, every patient died that got admitted to that hospital, basically. Uh, but again, there's a few cases where Every patient, at least according to the way the data was reported, every patient survived that got admitted to that hospital. And Terry, maybe you can comment on that, whether you've been able to see whether these ones are at the sort of the lower incidence uh, range. I'd have to dig into that. Yeah. So I guess the next thing would be, of course, I think everybody's thinking the same thing. So are these 100 percenters also the ones that had the lowest CPR rate? Uh, I'm sure that um, and they might have had the lowest ROS rate. So, you know, is there a is there a definite correlation between these and the previous graphs that you showed, uh, meaning there's some really um, poor performers or maybe some really good performers? Um, I'd love to see that because uh, that would be the ultimate. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's an important area that we can look at. When we think about the way this data is reported, so any, any one EMS system may be, may be admitting people to multiple hospitals, or any one hospital may be receiving patients from multiple transporting agencies. So it's hard to sort of do that sort of one-to-one -one analysis of uh, EMS transporting agency relative to hospital. So there'd sort of have to be a little bit more you know, granular look at that in terms of um, you know how, how that how the hospital-based care impacts the outcomes relative to any one uh, transporting agency. Does that make sense? Any other questions for Dr. Newmar? I have a question, Bob. So when you look at the variability, kind of in every aspect um, of the data, um, when you take that variability and go back to the um, systems of care, so not on one, not on one, not on one community EMS and hospital. What what bucket do you think we have the most opportunity in to yeah. improve the overall outcome of survival? Yeah. So so, and I know the people in the room will have heard this before. Is if you you know if you look at one EMS system of care, you've looked at one EMS system of care, and, and I think where this you know when we think about this quality improvement strategy, the value of each. Uh, you know, transporting agency and hospitals seeing their own data, right, and seeing where, you know, what their bystander CPR rate, what their uh, first responder AED rates are, uh, what their return of spontaneous circulation rates are. You know, the data that's available would, you know, in any one system would help drive where that, you know, where the chain of survival can be improved. So I think clearly, you know, one solution for, you know, one system or community may not be the same solution for another system or community. I mean, you can say overall, you know, we want to improve everything, but there's not the resources to and the, and the time and the bandwidth to focus on everything at the same time. So using the data to find out where, you know, relative to benchmarking against the state, you know, the rest of the state, where you have an opportunity for improvement might be the best way to, you know, focus the resources. And Dr. Granger has a comment, but um, yeah. also this is where, you know, the, the group can kind of take this back to their own community, identify areas that they can actually inter, uh, intervene upon and kind of try to understand their variability specifically and see if they can make some difference there. Yeah. So, Dr. Granger. Bob, that was great. You bring up this key issue that, uh, that, I, think that, that I think we need to focus on more, and that is the nursing home. Mm -hmm. and, and, because I think that's so important what you were highlighting there, and I don't think we've we've not done a very good job with trying to tease out um, uh, nursing home versus other settings. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to improve kind of the whole process in nursing homes. But as you point out, if you put if you keep the nursing home data in, maybe you're not getting a picture of what's happening in other parts of the community, and therefore. Um, you may not have the most reliable data on what to focus on. 
Yeah, this is the specific data I, I, you know, talked about was the public access AED, but I think even looking at bystander CPR rates, right, because they all, they do get included. Um, I think our data is about 10% of our out of hospital cardiac arrests are nursing home or nursing care facility. Uh, and if you, you know, if you pull those out and look at your, you know, bystander CPR rates separately and bystander AED application rates separately, your numbers are a little bit different. And, and, you know, what's really important, I think, is when you look at your survival rates, right? So one of the things, you know, related to that is, um, if you look at people that get bystander CPR and look at that survival rate, if you exclude the nursing home patients, the survival rate's much higher. And the impact of bystander CPR is much higher if you look at the subpopulation of uh, out of hospital arrests that uh, are not in nursing home. Well, you know, a related issue, I guess, is home versus public, right? Yeah. Like 70, 75 percent of patients having cardiac arrest at home. It's a somewhat of a different set of issues, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that, yeah, when we think about sort of improving the system of care, uh, you know, we focus a lot on, you know, when, and even when we, you know, teach ACLS courses and, and basic life support courses, sort of the scenario is you're typically, you know, in a public setting uh, and you're actually, you know, a, a assessing a stranger uh, and, and, you know, de you know, deciding about doing, you know, chest compressions, calling 911. And I think, you know, when, when the point you brought up, 70% of out-of-hospital cardiac arrests are in a home. Uh, if you look at uh, how... Uh, if you look at just demographics of, you know, residential situations where it's a single person there versus multiple people in the, in the home or the household, about 70, 75% of households have more than one person living there. So, you know, obviously a cardiac arrest at home when you're the only person living there, hard to do much about that unless you have Alexa diagnosing your agonal breathing or something like that, which actually there's technology out there for that, or you're wearing a watch that can diagnose it. Um, but if there's, you know, if there's someone in the home, what, what could we do more focus on sort of cardiac arrests at home, not only getting responders there quickly, but you know, what the, how to improve that uh, and plan for that in ways we plan for home fires and disasters and things like that. Just to emphasize the nursing home AED use. So um, in Michigan last year, um, bystanders um, AED was applied 10% of the time. But if we exclude the nursing home and healthcare facilities, and like Dr. Granger just said, over 75% of cardiac arrests occur in the home, only 1.5% had an AED applied. So that's very low. So that really sort of brings to light, you know, the importance of getting more AEDs out in public locations. Um, now, first res trained first responders apply AEDs, um, you know, police, first responders, before EMS arrives in 25% of the time, but it's that number of only 1.5% um, that we really need to work on in getting more AEDs in the community. Gwen? How many had bystander CPR? Okay, just, I mean, I think. But we do know, too, that every single one of the survivors here in the data had bystander CPR. Thanks for mentioning that, Gwen. You know, there's things you can do uh, while help is on its way. Yeah. Uh, any other final questions for Dr. Newmar or the group? Well, thank you, Dr. Newmar. Yeah, and I would just like to thank uh, all the people here who are involved in their EMS system, involved in you know participating in the in the CARES registry. Because as as Terry was mentioned and was mentioned in the the CARES video, uh, you know it. It's, it's work to do it, right? So uh, it's volunteer work to sort of put the data in the CARES registry, both from the transporting agencies and from the hospitals. But, you know, without that data, both, you know, statewide and locally, we won't be able to know uh, if the interventions we're investing in uh, are making a difference. 
And we certainly need, you know, the resources are limited, right? So uh, if we do interventions that aren't changing outcomes, we need to change gears and reassess and, 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 and find uh, interventions in our systems of care that really, really will improve outcomes. And the only way we can do that is uh, looking at this data on a regular basis. So thank you. Thank you so much.